Hi there, everyone. My name is Arthur Grau. I'm the Senior Communications Officer for the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, and I'm very happy to host today the MIT Scale Network informational webinar. We have people joining from five of our scale centers, so welcome. Sawat he, willkommen, bienvenue, bienvenidos, bienvenido. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. We hope today will be super informational and you will have a chance to ask any questions that you need to. So first, our presenters. Okay. Hey, good morning. My name is Chris Mejia. I work for MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, and I'm the director of the Graduate Certificate in Logistics and Supply Chain Management. Well, long history, but the, this uh, program was originally born in uh, CLI, our center in Colombia, and now it's taught completely here at MIT CTL. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the Luxembourg Center for Logistics and Supply Chain Management. So we are located in the country of Luxembourg in the center of Europe, so in a very international environment. And what we offer is a 10 month residential program in logistics and supply chain management with a high emphasis on cooperation with industry. Hello everybody, my name is Robert Cummings. I'm the academic administrator for the supply chain management program. Uh, here at MIT in the Center for Transportation and Logistics. Uh, we offer two programs, our residential program, which is 10 months long, 10 months long and our um, blended program, which is five months long, just started this January. Uh, looking forward to any questions you guys have. Good morning, my name is David Bayliss. I'm the director of the master's program at the uh, Malaysia Institute for Supply Chain Innovation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marta Romero. I'm the director of the International Master's Program in Zaragoza in Spain. Uh, we are currently offering three programs. So as Robert mentioned, the residential and the blended program. And also together with the center in Malaysia with uh, David, uh, we offer a brand new program, which is the Global Supply Chain Management Program. Happy to reply to any questions you may have. So thanks again for joining. I just wanted to give an overview of uh, what we have planned for today. First, we'll talk about um, student life and the experience. Uh, we'll get a little bit into the application process. Is that correct? Um, the MIT Global Scale Network, if you are not aware of it already, um, includes six centers of excellence with over 10 educational programs, um, 80 researchers, and over 180 students per year. Um, and so that's sort of the overview of the scale network in general. And who's gonna go first for specific program information? Admissions? Yeah, I can, yeah, you lead, I can kick us off. Great, thank you. Um, so all of our programs um, utilize the same application, um, for, or the same application to review applications. Um, our program admission cycle um, for the residential program starts in September. Um, and goes through March um, for, the for the blended program as well, um, the same time frame. Uh, we also offer the GC Log program um, with their application cycle as well. Um, oops, yeah, when you're done. Yeah, um, so yeah. Sorry, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks guys for the, the little bit of uh, back and forth here. I just wanted to mention, please enter your questions into the chat and um, I will surface them to the group. If you can include your name, it would be great because I'd love to call you out and, and say where you're from and, and what you're asking about with your questions. So that, that would be excellent if you can. Next program. Hi, um, the Malaysia Institute for Supply Chain Innovation has is a nine month uh, program. Um, we have MIT faculty. Um, we follow the curriculum of uh, MIT. Uh, one of the semesters is actually here at MIT, where we are today at the uh, independent activities period. Um, and on our program, we have extensive industry interaction. So it's a nine months program between August and May. And as um, Marta said earlier, we also have the GSEM program, which is a joint program with Zaragoza in Spain. Okay, so regarding our programs uh, on the admissions process, it's true that uh, we have what we call rolling admissions after the third round deadline. Uh, this is important for us uh, mainly because uh, we will have the admissions open for international students that need a visa to come to Spain. Uh, to the US and, and also to, to Malaysia. So that will be May 15th. If it's for uh, European uh, students who do not need a visa to come to Spain, then uh, we will have the admissions process open until uh, July 15th. 
So this is important that uh, that we let you know because that's maybe the only difference uh, regarding the MIT uh, residential program here at MIT. So as mentioned before, so the 10th month program, it's uh, our start program. Uh, this uh, is uh, the 16th generation that are, is here with me uh, uh, during these three weeks. And we also have the third generation of uh, the blended program. All the programs have in common that the students need to work on a thesis project and uh, uh, we work with uh, multinationals on securing projects for the students and uh, the projects are real life supply chain problems that the companies are facing uh, so this is of course very interesting uh, to our students um, so in Luxembourg, as said, we have a 10-month uh, residential program in logistics and supply chain management that is of the same quality or the same level as the one that is offered by the MIT. So our program uh, starts off with four months of core courses in Luxembourg in which you will learn all the fundamentals of logistics and supply chain management. Then in January, you will join the MIT for a month here in Boston at the IEP conference where you get to meet people from all the other centers. And then in the spring semester, you will return to Luxembourg and you can follow a number of electives to really, let's say, um, explore your interests. So we have a very wide offering uh, of different electives for you. And throughout the year, you will be working on your master thesis project. So each of our uh, master thesis projects is in collaboration with an industrial partner. So that means that each student will cooperate with a company and solve a real company problem. You'll also visit the company and be in close contact with them. And with this, we really try to generate an interaction between our students and industry life in Luxembourg and the neighboring countries uh, throughout the whole year. Okay, thank you. Well, in the case of the GCLOC program, uh, this is different from the other programs. I need to emphasize that. This is actually the only graduate certificate that is offered by the Global Scale Network. And in general, well, the, what we offer here is the flexibility. Uh, you're, you're going to be part of an eight-month program that is uh, actually uh, composed of four big models. The first one is like uh, an online model in order to build your foundations about supply chain management. The second one is a residential experience of three weeks here at MIT, where you're going to be receiving classes from MIT CTL faculty members. Then you're going to start in the third model, what we call the capstone project, that is going to be advised by one of the MIT uh, CTL faculty members too. And then you're going to come back to share with the other students from the other centers in the IAP period that we called. That's uh, basically it. Well, in terms of the uh, admission process, we have like three uh, rounds of applications. We usually open the first one. It's already closed now, but uh, we open every mid-November, every year. And then we have a second round of applications, usually at the end of January or the beginning of February. And the last one that is at the beginning of April. April. Can I take this back for just one second? Well, go ahead if you have something to add that's specific. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify the overall SCM program as well, um, as my colleagues here have um, pointed out. So the SCM program um, begins in September and also follows courses here at MIT um, from September all the way through May. Um, we have some exciting offerings um, in the spring. One of the big components of our program is um, the study track, where students get to visit companies and um, see real supply chain in action. Um, we also have the, our, our capstone projects um, where students work on a company project. Um, and in addition, um, the SCM program offers two degrees, uh, one in applied science and one in uh, engineering. Um, so the engineering degree is for students really focused on the research aspect. Um, so these, these are other components to keep in mind um, when applying to the program. Great. So what I'm hearing from the group is that almost uh, all of the programs have an industry component. So you're working closely with industry, global industry, often multinational companies, which is one of the reasons for being for the scale network is so that we could offer a program like this. All of the programs come together here in the winter for our scale annual connect conference, uh, spending time at MIT and meeting the other students. I think those are some some great points to and, and um, bring about the network effect that we're looking for by, by creating the global scale network. I wondered if each of you could just say one of the differentiators, what's one special thing about your location or your program? It could be student life, it could be part of the academics. Is there anyone that wants to bring up something interesting or, or special that we believe that all of, the, all of the centers have something special and different to offer, and that's, that's why we've created the network. Anyone bold enough to start? Yeah, sure. Um, 
so one of the things that makes the center in Luxembourg a bit different is that we are connected to the University of Luxembourg. So we are part of a big university, which brings a lot of um, nice benefits to it, I would say. So this means, for example, that if you are a student in our center, you're also a student of the university, meaning you can make use of all the things that student life brings. So you can make use of our library, of the sport facilities, um, so of life on a, on a university campus, which is really nice. And of course, this also means that while well, we have a lot of expertise in our group, so we'll have a lot of um, faculty with broad experiences that can support you um, throughout the year. So I think that's a, a very nice thing that makes the Luxembourg Center a bit unique. <coughs> Okay, so the Malaysian Centre, um, obviously the weather's a lot hotter than a lot of your other um, places. Um, and obviously it's a, a, a wonderful cultural experience coming to Asia, which as we all know is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, and um, the cost of living is also cheaper in Malaysia. Um, so we believe we actually have an, an awful lot to offer. Uh, if you come to uh, MISI. Okay, so of course uh, I'm going to beat them to it because we are in Spain, so sunny Spain. Uh, Spain has a lot to offer. We have a long history. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cultures that have been involved in the history of Spain. Uh, there's so much that, uh, that you can uh, visit and then you can travel easily to the rest of Europe that are uh, on a student life also. So you should account for a budget of 600 euros uh, for living expenses. Uh, I mentioned already the, the strong ties with the industry, which is very important to us. But then I, I just need to add, because they are truly magnificent, our alumni network, uh, which help us uh, through the year, not only with admissions, they also bring in thesis projects for the uh, programs. And they are also getting in touch with us in case they have any openings so that uh, current students can join them in their current uh, companies as well. I'd like to say that the the one aspect of the SCM program here at MIT that um, is truly unique is uh, our alumni network. Uh, we've just celebrated our 20 year anniversary. So we have an extensive alumni network who we utilize throughout, um, throughout the duration of the program from recruiting with companies to having guest speakers arrive, um, speakers throughout the, our IAP session. Um, our treks that I mentioned, we go visit um, companies on the West Coast who are often hosted by our, um, by our alumni. Um, so really that network is what the students find the most valuable takeaway from our program. Okay, in the case of the GCLOF program, well, this is gonna be our 11th generation or class being graduated from here. So we have graduated already like 300 outstanding students and also practitioners uh, from Latin America. What makes this program very unique, I could say that is the focus in emerging markets. I think that that's an important differentiator. And the fact that, uh, as I mentioned before, the flexibility, if you are currently working and you don't, do, you don't want to live like your current job, you can actually combine this experience with what you are doing right now. So this is more than executive education program because it's not only four days, it's actually eight months, as I mentioned to you. Probably you can find more information regarding the models themselves, but uh, definitely I think that the focus that we provide to create these new leaders in supply chain management and logistics for emerging markets is actually very important and also the networking that you, uh, that you get here. And then and one last piece about IAP, because I've been uh, been able to participate in it for the last few years. Um, um, inter, what does IAP stand for? Uh, independent Activities Independent period. Activities Period at MIT. MIT has designed the Independent Activities Period to allow for um, people from the campus to associate across departments and across centers. And we've capitalized with the the scale network on, on bringing people to campus, as we've mentioned, um, some of the things that happen when people are on campus is they do uh, simulations as teams, they do case competitions. The, the Apex is actually sort of an entrepreneurship competition. It's like a shark tank that they do. They go on industry visits. Um, everyone in the group um, tomorrow is heading to uh, a giant automated warehouse where I went last year. It's totally amazing. I felt like I was in the set of the matrix or something. It was really, really cool. Um, so there's a, it's a highly packed three weeks here on campus that people come. And I think it, as a centralizing force and as a unifying force, it's a, it's a really great uh, place to be. Next subject, or do you want to start to take some questions? Yeah, I think if we have any questions. Yeah. Okay. 
So we have an anonymous attendee. Um, so <laughs> that's okay, because that was the first question asked. So thank you very much. Um, can, can you two provide more information about the career prospects of the newly launched GSCM or Global Supply Chain Masters? Okay, so the, I think that uh, this is common to some of our programs. Uh, we uh, tell the students right from uh, the beginning that uh, um, we will help them as much as we can uh, with uh, recruitment, uh, but uh, the responsibility of finding a job uh, would be uh, the students. That being said, if you're enrolled in the GSCM program, both centers will help you with that process. So we will help you at the beginning in Zaragoza with your resume, with mock interviews, and even if you're not around uh, for the period of uh, for the spring period when uh, the recruitment process starts in, in Spain. Uh, we, we will also consider you for interviews, but also the center in Malaysia will arrange some interviews for you as well. Okay, just to add to that, um, um, as Marta said earlier, you would spend um, the first five months in Zaragoza, then come to MIT for a month, and the final four months would be at MISI. At MISI, we will continue with the career placement that starts at Zaragoza. Um, in Malaysia itself, um, it's a known fact that in Asia, there's a, a great lack of supply chain talent. So there are quite a number of opportunities. Um, we would also continue the practice that Marta mentions, where we would give you uh, resume tutorials, cover letter tutorials, um, we'd also um, give you some practical experience on interview techniques. So, as Marta also said, we're here to help you find another position. Obviously, we would like you to try and help yourself by uh, trying to source a few of your own companies, but certainly there will be a whole range of interviews for you to attend, both at Zaragoza and at MISI. Wonderful. And of course, um, as part of the global program, they will also be here with us on campus networking with the other 180 odd students. Uh, Mayank um, is an industrial engineer from Nagpur, India, and is asking about the GRE and for admissions. Now, each center is slightly different, so I'm going to let everyone speak to that a little bit. Okay, so um, from Malaysia, um, we, we actually take the application package as a whole. So yes, GRE is important, and there might be a slight difference in GREs from the various different centers. Um, but so for example, we would take um, your degree, having a good degree, your GMAT or GRE score, um, your resume, uh, your two recommendation letters, maybe you also have an MBA, uh, maybe you've taken the MicroMass programs, Six Lean Sigma, um, and also we take into consideration your passion for supply chain and, and obviously on top of that there's the IELTS as well. So from MISI's point of view we take the whole package into consideration. Um, so you might have a slightly lower um, GRE or GMAT but you've got other qualifications which, which compensate. Thanks David. Uh, we also take into account the whole application uh, as a whole. Uh, our uh, requirements for GMAT, uh, the minimum that uh, we require is 640. As for GRE, it could be so 75 percent uh, percentiles on the uh, on the quantitative part uh, and 50 percent uh, on the verbal. And uh, we also started uh, accepting SCOX, so uh, the first of the online courses that is offered by MIT CTL. And for that, uh, we would require 85 percent. If your scores are lower than this, don't worry too much about it because we, as uh, David mentioned, we take into account uh, the rest of your application materials. Uh, yeah, essentially MIT uh, reader, it's what Marta said. Um, for GRE and GMAT, um, our most competitive scores are usually above the 75th percentile. Uh, and for our uh, SC0X supply chain analytics uh, MicroMasters course, um, we recommend above an 85% um, uh, to be competitive in that area as well. Um, if you are uh, deficient in some of those, um, obviously we'll take into other into consideration your GPA, uh, your work experience, and other aspects of the application. Um, so in line with my colleagues from uh, from the other centers in Luxembourg, we also look at uh, the total application package of a student. We highly value you coming from uh, prior education with a mathematical 
um, or an analytical core, but if this is not the case, um, you can submit your GMAT or your GRE scores, um, or maybe you have followed the MicroMaster. So all of these things, um, I mean, we take into account. Also, we look at your work experience. We look at maybe internships that you have done. We look at your motivation letter. So really all of these things are taken into consideration um, when you file for your application. And as my colleagues already said, I mean, it's not because one of these things is maybe lacking or is less that you cannot compensate by, for example, a good academic record or a big passion for supply chain management. So these things are also all very important. Well, to avoid repeating, likewise, other centers, right? But I would say that particularly in the case of uh, the GCLOF program, GRE and GMAT is not that they are not important, of course they are, and, but in the case of the um, uh, GCLOF program and given also the audience that we are trying to attract, we know that they have uh, to pay an additional cost for this test. So we have or we give priority to other type of courses in order to analyze what is your quantitative background and analytical background? I think that those are extremely important. And as I mentioned by Robert, I think that if you are taking some courses from the MicroMasters, uh, if you are above or at least at 85%, that could be more than enough. But yeah, we will check case by case. If you have more questions, we can check that directly. Okay, and I forgot to mention that if you have an engineering background, then we can consider waiving the requirement. So in order to uh, be able to assess, uh, we would need to receive your transcripts. Great, this is very comprehensive answers. I really appreciate that. Um, I hope, Aditya, I hope that the question about Global Masters also answered your question. I think it was the same answer of the question you asked. Um, we have a, I'm going to take the questions a little bit out of order that you're seeing on the chat. I think it's more relevant to what we were just talking about. Um, I know that the SCM program here at MIT has a two-year work requirement. They require that an applicant has left the academic world and gone out to work for two years before they come to apply to our master's program, at least two years, often more. Can you all tell me about your program's work requirement? If it's the same or different? Yeah, well, let me start this time. So our profile of, let's say, incoming students is basically someone who is a graduate student currently in your home country, in your home university, most of the times, or well, pro, uh, well, preferably from Latin America, or that you are developing some kind of research in Latin America, or, well, if you are attracted by Latin America, that's our main focus. Let me emphasize that, okay? Um, if you recently graduated also from any of these graduate programs like masters, MBAs, PhDs, even other certificates, etc. You're more than welcome to touch base with us in order to see if you are eligible or not. Usually the threshold that we use is that you graduated two years ago, probably not more than that, but we need to check it case by case. I think that's more or less the, the idea behind our incoming students. Um, so in Luxembourg, typically people who apply for the program have a couple of years of work experience. Um, this can be two, but we also have people with uh, many more years, so it can be seven or more. And we have also in the past accepted people to our program without any professional experience at all. Um, so I think as we stressed also before, we accept people with very different backgrounds and we look at a total package. So for example, if you have no professional experience, but you have an excellent academic record or you have done some internships, this can also be taken into consideration. At uh, MISI, we also um, um, like students ideally to have at least two years work experience. But just to recap on what Cyril was saying earlier on, we also very closely look at what quantitative skills um, students have. And as Marta said, or an engineering background, which generally always has the quantitative skills attached to it. Um, but yes, we prefer them to have um, two, to, two to five years work experience. In fact, we find the average age of our students at MISI somewhere between 80, 28 and 35 years old. I would say that was the average age band. Okay, so and our program is uh, no different. Uh, so ideally, it would be a, a minimum of two years of experience. Uh, it is true, as my colleagues uh, just said, that uh, in some cases we've uh, seen some profiles of recent graduates uh, which, where we've seen the, uh, the, the talent and the potential. So we've admitted uh, these, these people to, to the program and, and uh, they've done extremely well. Uh, that being said, so we have people on both ends, so uh, recent graduates with little work experience as well as people with more than uh, 
10, 15 years of work experience. So uh, we invite all uh, candidacies, uh, regardless of, of age and uh, experience. Uh, it really is uh, a plus if you have a supply chain experience, but if you come from uh, other backgrounds, uh, your application is also welcome. So we have we do have a specific question uh, about um, being in a, a totally different or related industry. So it's okay for people to apply if they're from a related industry uh, and they want to move into supply chain. Yeah, I'll definitely comment on that. Um, yeah, we've definitely seen applicants who come from a wide background. Um, we consider both general work experience and supply chain focused work experience. Um, so both are taken into consideration within the application. Um, and in terms of educational background, we've seen applicants even from philosophy or the humanities apply and been able to to gain admission here at MIT. Um, engineering uh, and business and finance are usually the the areas that applicants apply to most from. Um, and I'd also just like to comment on um, the range of experience that we see um, amongst our programs. So our residential program is usually geared towards um, uh, incoming, applic in incoming applicants with between two to seven years of work experience. Um, our blended program also offers opportunities for more senior people with um, more work experience. Um, so mid-level to higher level um, applicants as well, um, maybe three to eight years of work experience. Great. So um, th these programs are conducted all over the world and all of the programs to my knowledge are conducted in English. Um, do you have similar or differing English language requirements, ITLS uh, scores? Okay, so in Malaysia, we do have um, a government stipulation that all incoming international students have to have competency in English. And so basically, um, if they're um, students where English is not their first language, they would have to have IELTS or where the medium that they're taught in is not English, they would also have to have IELTS. Um, and an, an average IELTS score really would be around 6.5 or 7 that we would be looking for, although the Malaysian government is actually less. Um, I think I can just speak a little bit more broadly for, um, for MIT. Uh, we do accept waivers of the IELTS and TOEFL exam um, within the application. Uh, often we'll consider um, your general education if you've got an, a degree from a US uh, or from an English speaking university. Um, that can include anywhere in the UK, Australia, the US as well. Um, but we are a little bit more flexible with, um, with our requirements here. Um, so in Luxembourg, we typically also require, um, as in Malaysia, ILTS or TOEFL test. But as Robert already said, um, first, it's also the case that if you are a native English speaker or you had a prior education in English, that it is possible to waive um, this requirement. What I also want to note with that is that we, for example, also look at your motivation letter because you will there be writing this in English. So we can also evaluate your level of English based on, based on this letter. So, thank you, Sarah. So in short, yeah, we don't ask again for this test. It can be expensive, right? So what we do is also to analyze your English proficiency through your recommendation, uh, sorry, through your motivation letter or the way in which you speak and you develop some kind of interviews. I actually develop some kind of random interviews from time to time in order to double check your listening, speaking and other skills. Yeah. Um, I, I won't repeat what my colleagues have said because it's same, the same applies to our programs. And also, uh, you have to have into consideration that as a part of your application, you will need to submit a video statement. So my recommendation, and I think everybody's, could be uh, just try to be spontaneous. Uh, we want to see your soft skills. So try not to read from the screen because we can tell. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I'm not reading from the screen, um, slightly, <laughs> but we can I hope you can tell. Us. So um, Aditya asked a related question about the placements for the global master's program. Are there specific placements uh, available from Zaragoza? Well, Aditya, we work with a number of companies and we've been working over the years. So the idea is that uh, some of these companies are going to come and recruit. Uh, so for this academic year uh, from February onwards, and that it will be the same case uh, for, for the following year if you're enrolled in the Global Supply and Management Program for academic year 
2021, I think. So yes, there is there is prospect. So uh, if uh, you aim uh, to have placement in in Europe, uh, some of the companies uh, that's something that you also have to have in mind is that. Uh, uh, some companies may not sponsor work permits, and I think that this is a case for most of uh, the, the programs. Uh, that being said, uh, if you target the companies, then we can work together. So not only uh, in Zaragoza, but also in Malaysia to try to find the, the job that you're looking for. So we will support you in, uh, in that sense. Okay, so just to add to that, um, yes, we, all, we have business partners in Malaysia, just the same as they do in ZLC. And the same business partners come every single year to interview our, our students for one very good reason. And I'm say, sure it's the same at all the other centres is they're fully aware of the standard of student that uh, the scale centre produces. And that's why they come back every year. Uh, obviously, as we said earlier, we help the students with their resume, their cover letter, their interview techniques. But ultimately, it's down to the student when it comes to the interview to convince the, uh, the employer that they're the right person for them. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to combine a couple of questions, one from Jekin and then anonymous attendee. That's a great name you have. Um, so what about the person who has entrepreneurship experience or wants to have entrepreneurship experience and the person who may have started their own business, maybe 13 years in the field, maybe a little bit older? Can you speak to how the program is good or maybe not so good for them at your center? Sure. Um, so yeah, in terms of work experience, as I mentioned, uh, especially more senior executives or people who are further in the workforce, um, often we would recommend trying to pursue the MicroMasters um, in supply chain management uh, and pursuing our blended program. Um, given that it's only five months on campus, uh, it's more realistic that somebody can take the time out of their work schedule um, to, uh, to pursue the MicroMasters um, while they're working and then come to MIT for just the five months. Um, Entrepreneurship is a big initiative here at MIT, so there are definitely groups um, that can help um, up-and-coming entrepreneurs uh, create their business. Um, I actually just saw an advertisement yesterday, um, and our students here are very engaged in um, that idea as well. Um, so there's definitely resources available um, supporting both ends. If I um, might just start, uh, a couple of students found out that uh, during these uh, independent activities programs, there's lots of opportunities for students to do all the things besides uh, the three week study that uh, they're uh, undertaking here. So one of uh, the courses that uh, is being offered at the moment is entrepreneurship. So some of the students are currently attending the six sessions. Uh, it's an intensive course, but uh, they can manage because it's right after their, their regular classes. So there's lots of things that you can do besides uh, what's planned for you uh, during these three weeks, although it's a heavy schedule. But as you can see, uh, there's many things that uh, you will be able to do if, uh, if you're interested in entrepreneurship. Probably I will add a little bit here. Um, in the case of the GCLO program, we have actually a week where we teach entrepreneurship in supply chain management. And, and the idea is to help uh, like the different profile of people that we bring to the program. So we have people from 25 years old until actually 50 years old in order to take advantage of this type of course and actually develop something like that we call the micro uh, logistic challenge. And is actually to create like a kind of a startup out of this. So I don't want, I want to spoil this too much. But that's more or less the idea, and uh, this helps you actually prepare and put into practice what you will learn with the other guys that are coming from different backgrounds and different industries. And actually, this is quite an adventure. Uh, so in Luxembourg, part of our program is also about leadership and management. So we have some courses that also um, focus on, for example, leadership skills. Um, and as Marta already mentioned, indeed, here at the IAP, you also get the opportunity um, to take some extra entrepreneurship related um, courses so that gives you a, a great a great start there thanks sarah so i have some questions specifically for luxembourg um just one from akbar is ie lts enough for your entrance uh so um so for the language so we have either ilts or TOEFL. so either of the two um is good to to, to show your uh, english capabilities Thank you. And then this is very specific. ECTS score is 120. Is that sufficient to apply? 
I think for that, I would have to uh, refer you um, to our contact person so I can um, give you an, an email we'll address. Up. Yeah, we'll so I can and give you an email address um, to check for these, uh, for these numbers. Um, and after this webinar, we'll be sending automatic emails to everyone who's attended. And uh, if you are watching this later after the webinar, um, we will still be able to communicate with you with fine details, links, and email addresses for, for all the people that you may need to speak with. So Vikrant is asking about scholarship, asking about money. Can we talk about what is available from the various centers as far as helping people finance their education? Uh, yeah. Actually, specific to the global oh. master's program. I would like to hear about it from everyone, but if you want to start with the global, yeah. and that would yeah. be great. Okay, so this is a, a matter that uh, it's currently being discussed because uh, for the time being, there is uh, no scholarships available, but uh, we're going to discuss about this uh, next week. We do have a very good financial aid program for uh, the residential program, uh, which includes a, a loan which is available and that can cover up to 70% of tuition. And we have different scholarships available. So uh, supply chain pro uh, promising uh, professionals, we have a scholarship which is specific uh, for women and that can cover up to 50%. We have uh, master DC competition for Spanish candidates that uh, can be a full scholarship, scholarship for Spanish students, for European students, we have a scholarship for African students. Uh, so we know that in some cases financing um, may be difficult because uh, tuition is high and you're also expected to live 10 months abroad, so we would try to help you as much as we can. And also for the blended program, uh, there is no scholarship available so far. Okay, so really for all centres, I think we would all say that try and complete your application with everything you've possibly got to give us everything. Show us how good and what skills you've actually got and that will really help give you the opportunity to, to put forward and ask us for scholarships. But without all the information, it's very difficult to, for us to actually answer this question. Uh, yeah, MIT has um, funds available for fellowships, both for our blended and residential programs. Um, we offer fellowships for um, merit, um, our Scale Scholars Fellowship. We also have um, scholarships for diversity, including women in supply chain. Um, and we partner with the awesome organization to offer one um, full, full fellowship um, for advancing women in supply chain, uh, which we will be excited to announce um, later this month. <laughs> So we offer um, scholarships that can range between 25% and 100% of your admission fee. And important to note here is that for us, the scholarship application is open to everyone. So regardless of, um, of your background, so everyone can, uh, can apply for these, uh, for these scholarships. Well, in my case, uh, actually, the, the tuition waivers of the GCLO program go from 10% to actually 70%, to be completely honest. We have a very nice scholarship that is 100%, but it, this is actually reserved uh, for someone who lives in a vulnerable posi uh, position and actually who can become a change agent in their community. So uh, as you can imagine, this is very specific and we have actually granted that type of scholarship only two times in the whole history of the program. So just to give you an idea, okay. Wonderful, thank you. Go ahead. Um, Chris triggered my memory that uh, MIT itself also offers uh, fellowships for our applicant, for students to MIT um, for very specific ranges. Um, we have fellowships for Egyptian students. Um, if you've worked in the agricultural industry, um, even fellowships if you're from the state of Texas. So they're very yeah. specific <laughs> um, and we'll consider those um, at the time that you apply. Yeah, yeah. and there is, a, there is a financial office at MIT that carries a lists and lists of current um, fellowship and scholarship opportunities that are available based on various conditions that you might find yourself in or various permutations. Um, Moises asks, um, about uh, the difference between, or can folks comment on, uh, he's thinking about applying, he or she is thinking about applying to the round three deadline this year or the round one deadline next year. Is there an advantage to either or to the deadlines or? Uh, I'll lead off. Um, one thing to take into consideration uh, is just your work experience. So if you have met that 
uh, level of work experience, have at least two, two to five years, um, then you really can take advantage and apply in round three this year um, to um, see what your options are. Um, if you're still um, if you're still looking to gain a little bit more experience, then it might make sense to wait um, a little bit longer. Um, for our blended program, you do need to take the full um, mi MicroMaster's credential, um, so you might have to plan some extra time to finish those as well. Um, and it's just really determining if you can complete the GRE, um, the GMAT requirement um, in time as well. Quickly, I think that this is more like a strategic power on your side and i agree with robert on all what he mentioned but actually in the case at least of the gslog program every time we receive a higher quality in the students and also the variety of profiles that we are we well that are we that we are receiving is very diverse so i don't know it could be that probably your chances or the, the opportunity that you get admitted in the third round probably are going to be higher but i mean it's something that is difficult to mention to be honest it's up to you and up to let's say how you feel about applying now or later great thank you very much um can folks apply to more than one center mm -hmm. yep yes so tell, talk about the talk about the application a little bit uh, yeah, so we welcome applications to all of our centers. We all um, sync on the same um, admission cycle with three rounds for our residential programs and two rounds for our blended programs. Um, one advantage, if you um, if you only apply to our scale centers, there is no application fee. Um, if you apply to MIT, we do require the $75 application fee. Um, and if you're looking to, if you've been qualified for both programs, um, you only have to pay one fee. Um, so we're we're happy to consider your application for both both styles of programs. Um, in terms of the application process and um, the other components, I think we've it reiterated a lot of the, the major pieces, your video statement, a written statement. Um, it's also worth mentioning that you would require two letters of recommendation, um, usually one from an academic source and one from a professional source. Um, what are the other components? Your GRE and GMAT, which we've discussed pretty pretty extensively and then just the application as a whole um, yeah I think that's a the, the largest overview possible <laughs> great and that, that covers everyone yeah um, can you talk a little bit about the letters of recommendation as well that you'd like to have from folks who are applying the types of letters you'd like to get well, I think Robert already commented on that. Uh, it's true that uh, we prefer to have one from academia and one from industry, but it will really depend on your profile. So if you've been working for 15 years, it may be very difficult to get a, a professional recommendation from a, a professor that you had uh, more than uh, 20 years ago. So then uh, we would take uh, two uh, industry uh, recommendations. But ideally, if you're like uh, on average of age and uh, of work experience, we would like to have one of each. Can I just add it? Uh, we also look for if you can have a letter of recommendation from your immediate boss rather than somebody else. It's also very beneficial as well. And just one comment for those who are eager to provide as many letters of recommendation as possible. <laughs> um, we do have to cap it uh, at five. So it, it is, an, it is um, in your best interest to select the, the reviewers that, you can, that can provide you the most competitive applicants. Uh, recommendation um, to stay within that range. <laughs> And I will just add, so of course, uh, no family members, no friends are uh, submitting applications for you. Uh, immediate boss, in some cases, we found it difficult because probably you haven't told your boss already that uh, you want to enroll in a master's program, but uh, someone whom uh, you've been uh, reporting to or working close with, uh, that'd be great. Excellent. Any other comments there? Okay, so there's still some curiosity about Luxembourg <laughs> and the GRE requirement. Can you just talk a little bit more on um, if it's required? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have indeed um, normally the requirement of a GMAT or GRE, but if you have a prior education that is analytical or mathematical, so we're thinking, for example, an engineering background, um, this could also, I mean, waive your GMAT or your GRE because this shows that you have uh, strong analytical capabilities. Although if you come from a center that is 
lesser known, if you come from a smaller university or a lesser known university, then we do recommend to submit um, the GMAT or the GRE just to really show us um, that you are a strong analytical thinker. Thank you again. Appreciate that. I think some people might be joining later, so they're missing some of the earlier <laughs> questions. This um, webinar is recorded and it will be made available to everyone who's registered. So if you felt like you've missed part of it, you can go back and uh, see the beginning part. Um, so student life, a little bit about student life. Um, we're rounding in on being about an hour, so I, I will probably start to wrap it up. Um, are students able to work while they're pursuing their degrees at your center? Um, so I'll comment from MIT. Um, we, our program is full time and you can expect to have classes from 8.30 all the way until 7 p.m. on certain days. Um, uh, you would independently craft your own schedule, but definitely it wouldn't allow time for working. Um, for international students in particular, we do not um, offer um, on-campus work experience as a part of the program, so you would not get work authorization. Um, so it is full-time, will require more than 40 hours in devotion. So. And MISI is very, very similar. In fact, we have other programs. We have a, a master's part-time program at MISI, um, where a lot of the classes are at the weekend. So some of the full-time students would also join the part-time students at the weekend. And we also have evening classes. So basically, just to um, reaffirm what Robert was saying, it's really a full-on program. So there's no opportunity, I'm afraid, at MISI to work. Uh, yeah, so the same, as my colleague said, also holds for Luxembourg. So we have a full-time program where you have classes usually between 9 uh, a.m. and 5 p.m., so really between regular business hours. We do foresee one free day per week in the program, but that is usually meant to work on your master thesis project, so that wouldn't really leave room for you to do a full-time job at the same time. Okay, in Zaragoza, unfortunately, so you will be in the country on a student visa, so you won't be able to, uh, to work. And of course, as my colleagues were mentioning, so your days are going to be very full. So that wouldn't be an option either. Uh, you will usually have class in the morning and then uh, you're going to have to have uh, um, group assignments, individual assignments, so 40 or beyond. So work is not a possibility, but uh, besides taking uh, the courses and the masters, uh, there will also be time uh, to have some fun. In the case of the GSLOC program, as I mentioned before, um, actually this will allow you to work, but not here in the US, right? So basically it means that you're gonna be working in your home country. And just let me emphasize a couple of things. So you are gonna be coming to MIT three weeks in July and three weeks in January. The rest of the experience that before the first residential experience is an online course that you're gonna be taking. So you will manage your time to do that, but this is remotely. So you will, you will be connecting from your computer elsewhere in the world and uh, you will go for it. In the case of the third model, that is the capstone project, it's a three-person team project. Well, you're gonna be, well, arranging or scheduling meetings with your advisor, but you, not, you don't need to be on campus. So just let me emphasize that. So the flexibility comes from you working uh, in your current work or in your current uh, home country, but not here. Actually, I never recommend that even if you come here during July for the first uh, seminar, you should, actually ask for vacation because it's very intensive. So you're gonna be receiving like 30 classes, so forget about that. Actually, in average, I think that the people sleep like mm, three, four hours per night. So <laughs> that's, that's it, it's very intensive. So I'm, I'm just gonna, because I'm the communications officer, I can, I can do this, you guys can't. It's MIT people, you're not gonna have time to work. I work here and I work all the time as well, just to support the program. So. It's rigorous. It's amazing. There's always a lot to do. There's always a lot to explore at all of the partner universities, but also at MIT when you're on campus. And then the network of people that you meet, they've had work experience. We've got three questions right now from Rajiv, Bilaj, and Jatin, who are probably at the same phase in their career that I'm at, 12, 15, 17 years of experience. We answered this question earlier, but I I was just going to bring it up again. It seems like there are a lot of people who want to be in the supply chain field. Is there a room for folks who have a lot of experience? Just one comment would be good, even though we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, I'll throw out my earlier comment. Um, often we see 
applicants to the blended program with um, more experience. So I would say that is one avenue to definitely take into consideration um, if you're looking for an academic experience with a full degree. Um, try to focus on the MicroMasters and supply chain and um, consider the blended program. We have blended programs in Zaragoza and at MIT and, and MISI as well. Um, I am going to make a quick plug. We have about eight minutes left. I'm going to make a quick plug for the MicroMasters. If you're located anywhere that's not close to one of our centers and you'd like to get a taste of what kind of material that we will be working with in the programs, I would definitely suggest going to edX.org, checking out the MicroMasters and Supply Chain Management courses. There are 10 per year. It's a great way to get your feet wet. You can see the content for free. Uh, you only have to pay if you wish to have an assessment and, and go on the track. So a little plug for those to get an idea. Of course, the SCALE website has a lot of information. But for the last few minutes here, what's the fun stuff? What do people get to do that's going to be fun, that's going to be non-academic or outside of uh, what they're doing to get their degree completed? Uh, so I'll jump in. Um, uh, for MIT, um, you get to network with your 80 um, cohort students. Um, so we have 40 for the residential for, uh, program and 40 for the blended. Um, and really, it's the that alumni engagement that they that they bring. They become a network that um, that they use throughout their life. But that we hear time and time again. Um, outside of the classroom, they are organizing events. They just went on a ski trip last weekend. Um, we'll have our study track and spring break coming up. So there's a lot of social interactions um, throughout the year that I think really define the program. Because when you reflect on your time at school, um, probably maybe half of your time you'll think about the classes, but you also think about the people you met and the experiences you shared. So I think that is um, <clears throat> by having such a tight knit cohort of 40 students for each program, it really um, supports supports you and supports everybody else. Okay, so at Malaysia, we have a lot of cultural events similar to Robert. We also take our students uh, to various different visits, to company visits. Um, it could be to one of the ports in Malaysia because as we know, the Malay Straits is one of the, the biggest uh, um, seafaring ports in the world, so we take them to the Malay Straits. There are lots and lots of cultural events. Um, Malaysia is a multi-cultural uh, society, so this week we have Chinese New Year, which is a week off. We have Hari Raya, which is the Muslim uh, week that we have. We have Diwali, which is the uh, Indian week, and then obviously we have Christmas as well, so we have lots of holidays. So there's lots of stuff to do down there, okay. So yes, it's, it's a great place to be. And I've lived there 24 years now, so, uh, okay. Okay, so if you decide to come to Zaragoza, so then uh, you'll live uh, the Spanish experience uh, to the maximum. So uh, not only the culture that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, but also the food is fabulous. Uh, we know how to party, like uh, all the places will be open all night long. So, uh, as I mentioned, the program is very intensive, but it, there is time uh, to have fun. And then, of course, uh, you can travel all around the country. We have beautiful islands, and we're also just a uh, two-hour fly away from uh, the main uh, uh, major European cities. So, you might know that Luxembourg is a pretty small country. Um, it is really located in the heart of Europe. So that means, well, one, we are an international and multilingual environment, which is really nice to be um, if you're an international student. Also, of course, if you're a local student, you must know that 40% of the people in Luxembourg are actually expats. So it makes it really nice to interact with a lot of people and have come from all over the world. Uh, of course, Luxembourg itself is a really nice well, both city and country to, to live in, but it's also a good starting point to explore the rest of Europe because you can really get anywhere uh, in a really short amount of time. So next to the program, you can also do that. And you must know that Luxembourg is also well, an industrial and a financial heart really in Europe where there are a lot of big companies present. And as my colleagues already mentioned, we really try to also get you to interact with those companies also throughout the program. I mean, we have Amazon, we have Microsoft, we have Vodafone. So we really have some multinationals present in Luxembourg. And we really try to also get you in touch with those people, get to visit companies um, to really enrich the whole experience. Okay, thank you. Well, I will try to divide like the funny part of the GISLO program, right, in three parts. So the first one is what we prepare here on campus, right? When the people are here, 
we also have like certain parties, we have barbecues, etc. So that's the funny part, right? Of course, we from time to time we hang out with each other. So that's the good part of the program. And we also prepare like the formal part. That's the second part that I want to talk about. We have like site visits and other type of uh, very interesting sightseeing uh, activities. And the third one probably is the most interesting one is once you get graduated, of course, this is like an international community. So you will have the opportunity to be visiting different countries. And this happens actually right now, because remember that the third module, uh, you are abroad, not here at MIT. So some colleagues or students are actually traveling to other countries, uh, visiting the, the, their current classmates, right? So it's funny. So yeah, I would say that's the funny part. Excellent. So thank you all for taking an hour today out of the IAP schedule. I know it's seven to seven every day. So I really appreciate you all being here for an hour. Um, it's great. We have about two minutes left. I would like to use because we do have two questions. Uh, well, there's actually three questions about um, work. Um, sorry, my, my bad. Uh, is a local language necessary in Luxembourg <laughs> in order to uh, work there? someone were to come and watch. Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, so the answer is no, because Luxembourg is such an international environment. Everybody speaks English in Luxembourg, so you can perfectly come there, live there, um, study and find a job in English. So it is highly appreciated if you speak French or German, but it is not, it is not required. And the Luxembourg, so the, the other official language, um, is not a requirement for sure to, to get a job there. What is also nice to know is that our university offers courses in French and in German um, for really low rates. So if you would like um, to get familiar with one of the local languages, then this is also an option. But English is for sure um, enough to get around in Luxembourg. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you again. Um, definitely apply. Um, definitely reach out. We'll be following up with a lot more information. And uh, hopefully this has been helpful for you uh, in understanding a little bit more about our programs. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.